Hello and welcome on behalf of all the teams of Mid Mothers Matter MMM. Welcome to all our speakers and wel welcome to you who have joined from wherever you are for this high level political forum side event from MMM on care and education cornerstones for sustainable and just economies. This is our first virtual event at this level. The webinar can also be followed on our Facebook page, accessible from the MMM website, www.makemothersmatter.org. Care. Care is essential to all human beings. At some point in our lives, for all of us, it's a question of, sur of survival. And our current economic system completely ignores its value. Care and education subsidize our economies and they are considered endless and free resources. The pandemic has highlighted the importance of care and paradoxically, this crisis is giving us an opportunity to build back better. So before I introduce our esteemed speakers, we would like to share a short MMM video featuring sound bites from some of our MMM grassroots members who are telling us how, what they think on how building back better. This, I think one of the things that um, this time has showed is the value of people who care. So I'm hoping that um, some light is shone on the actual work that's done at home. And then maybe from that, um, you know, from, from that base that we can say, well, actually it really needs supporting because it, it sort of is a base of the family and it's a base of the community. Invertir en la mujer, sobre todo en la mujer madre, es una inversión rentable mm -hmm. porque trae como consecuencia desarrollo, es decir, la mujer es multiplicadora en su familia, en su barrio, en su entorno, y sobre todo generas este, una cultura de paz. We need to reform the, the healthcare system uh, for mothers and decentralize it. We don't need to uh, invent anything, we just need to look at the countries uh, that already implemented this. Yo creo que hoy más que nunca, tenemos que volver la cabeza hacia ese mundo rural, una actividad fundamental para alimentar a la sociedad, que ha sido nuestra agricultura y nuestra ganadería. Y ahí están las mujeres. La agricultura urbana es toda la comunidad que comienza a hacer de petits potagers a Goma. Y HAD multiplica aún ese potager, esa producción, eso sí amenará a su mère de hacer des actividades generales de revenir. Y eso sí podría remontar un poco la economía de la población. La vie en communauté est extrêmement importante. On vit souvent dans des maisons avec des familles élargies. Euh, L'accès à l'eau n'est pas du tout évident. Ce qui est très compliqué, c'est que la plupart des personnes vivent au jour le jour. Donc un jour sans travail, c'est un jour sans manger. La digitalisation. Il y a un nouveau monde qui avait montré ses prémices qui faisait que tout le monde, bien sûr, communique avec un smartphone ou un téléphone. Mais quand il s'agit de passer la vie, parce qu'il s'agit de la vie, quand on vous envoie de l'argent par un téléphone, il s'agit de la survie et de la vie. La flexibilité eh, laborale a arrivé pour rester, que nous sommes dans un nouveau paradigme et que, pour le temps, le travail se rige pour d'autres por otras caractéristiques. Par exemple, le humanisme, la santé de nos collaborateurs, la déconnexion digitale, pourquoi ne pas bâtir l'économie dans le respect des valeurs humaines, mais pas uniquement sur la base de la croissance économique et des profits Donc, on voudrait bâtir un monde nouveau, un monde plus humain. The pace of human needs, wants, greed, power, money, you know, all this has totally not cared about others who have right on this planet. If we do not take this into consideration in the next steps that we are going to have, then I think we need to worry a lot about the future. We have 
heard how much all over the world there is a desire and need for change. All our speakers here are committed to make change happen. We are delighted to have you with us today. The background material on all the speakers is posted on our website and you received the address on the chat. I will then take the liberty to introduce them on a more, more personal note. Our first speaker is Nancy Fowler. Nancy, we are extremely happy to have you with us today. For years, your writing has been nourishing our advocacy and even our own commitment to the cause that you defend so actively. I personally discovered you through your book, Valuing Children, in which you say, not all inputs and outputs come with price tags attached. Somewhere along the way, babies are conceived, nurtured, educated, and launched into adulthood in a process that requires considerable time, effort, as well as money. That says so much already, and what a recognition for mothers and fathers. So Nancy, really welcome here, and the floor, the screen is yours. You know, it's so heartening to be part of a global conversation about this global crisis, especially now that um, the United States is experiencing such a traumatic and difficult um, form of political division and inability to really cope uh, with the, uh, the global pandemic. So uh, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this, this larger conversation. Um, I feel like we have a lineup of um, really great panelists. So I'm just gonna give a, a kind of general overview um, to put things in context, if I could have my slides um, put up. I, I, I would like to situate our discussion of care in a larger picture of the commons, things that are unpriced, um, things that are not bought and sold in the market, but things that are absolutely central, essential to the functioning of the global economy. And that includes people, people's capabilities, but also the natural environment, um, the ecological services we depend on, the our, our stock of human knowledge, our understanding of ourselves and of each other. Uh, I think these are these are all um, these are all public goods that that we need to um, um, re really try to persuade not just policymakers but the public in general of the importance of cooperation and collaboration in and mutual aid and in, in um, the protection of the global commons. Next slide. So as an economist, uh, and I'm sure later speakers will touch on this point, um, uh, I think we have a really serious problem of excessive focus on gross domestic product um, on the value of goods and services that are bought and sold. You know, these are a relatively small component of a larger economic system. And we really need to replace gross domestic product by a kind of dashboard of, of a variety of indicators that give us a better sense of, of where we've been and where we're going. I love this image of Jim Warren's um, Mother Nature just because she looks, um, I don't know, she has a mysterious power um, and commands our respect. Uh, so I think it's a good idea to keep her in mind. Next. Um, I also love this, this, uh, this photograph by Ann Geddes of, of children um, in a cabbage patch. And I, here's the reason I like it. For years, the United States has published, um, has published estimates of uh, expenditures on children. And they've always focused exclusively on cash expenditures, expenditures that could be easily denominated in dollar terms. And I've spent like more than 20 years uh, trying to persuade them uh, to include an estimate of the value of, um, of time, of parental time, of maternal time, of community time uh, going into it. But here's the kicker that I think um, justifies this slide. Those annual estimates, um, of the cost of children provided in the US are provided by an agency called the Department of Agriculture. 
So there you see at least a small acknowledgement that children really are an important crop. Next slide. So um, I don't want to suggest that we should reduce our discussion of care uh, to dollars and cents or to think about parenting as though it's just another corporation. Um, but I am an economist and I try to talk to economists. So sometimes thinking a little bit uh, about um, in a metaphorical way about the connection between the family economy and the larger economy um, uh, is useful. Next. Uh, you know, in the US, we have uh, something called uh, individual retirement accounts that have been promoted as a way of, of savings in old age, of savings for retirement. And um, I sometimes like to show this slide to economists just to point out that uh, we're not all just depending on our individual retirement accounts. You know, the ad says, take care of it, and it just might take care of you one day. Well, I think that's the principle that we want to generalize to each other, that we take care of each other. And uh, uh, we're pretty hopeful if we do that other people are going to take care of us. And that's the larger form of reciprocity on which we all depend. Next. So let's be careful when we talk about the cost of care and measuring the cost of care and valuing care uh, and so forth and so on, to realize that it's not just that care is costly, um, it's that the costs are very unequally distributed. They're very unfairly distributed. And mothers clearly are paying a very unfair share. Um, that has been uh, dramatized by the effects of uh, the pandemic and the sequestration policies that have uh, followed in just in today's New York Times in the here in the US, a uh, very interesting report of the impact on mothers' employment hours being five times greater than the employment effect on, on uh, fathers' employment hours. So that's just uh, one particularly memorable indicator of uh, the distribution of the costs. But also remember, it's not just the cost between men and women or bet between um, mothers and fathers. It's also the cost between parents and non-parents, um, between rich people and poor people, um, between um, uh, you know, really among all of us. And uh, again, another indicator in terms of current events in the US is that many public schools will be unable to open in the fall because they lack the financial resources to provide the investments in safety uh, that are required for opening. On the other hand, many private schools where parents able to pay high levels of tuition uh, will be opening uh, under relatively safe conditions. So what we're seeing are, are policies that are really, policies here in the US that are really uh, actively undermining uh, public provision of, of care and education. And that's something that we need to um, really get tough about um, fighting back against. Next. Okay. The future is a public good. There's no price on it. Uh, we are all dependent on it. Um, we can't exclude other people from participation in it. And um, uh, we really need to mobilize around it. And I guess uh, I'm going to leave the very specific recommendations to, to the other speakers, but I'll, I'll just conclude by saying um, we really need to talk to each other. We need to develop a better interdisciplinary analysis of the um, problems that we're facing. We really need to talk to the public. We need to stop thinking about fellow academics or policymakers as our audience, and we really have to translate our our arguments into ordinary language and and make them um, uh, make them compelling um, as compelling as possible. Um, and I think we need to really uh, we need to ramp up. Uh, we need to get tough. We need to be more proactive about um, uh, 
the really urgent tasks ahead of us. Uh, and uh, I agree that the pandemic has given us an opportunity uh, to move forward, uh, but it's also created some really serious risks. Uh, uh, and one of those big risks is the possibility that, that we won't succeed. So um, uh, I, hope, I hope we can all bear down on it together. And I'm, I'm really optimistic about our potential to fight back. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy, for being optimistic and uh, fighting because I think it's really necessary. And I loved your slide about mom company because that could show maybe that care is work. Care work, even though unpaid, is work. Our next speaker is Rima Sala. Rima, you have been a long friend of MMM and you introduced MMM to the Early Childhood Peace Consortium that you founded and have been sharing since then and also inspiring. The vision of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium is that children and families can be agents of change for peace. And the vision of MMM is that mothers can be agents of change for a better world. We are indeed very close. The title of your book, Pathways to Peace, the transformative power of children and families show how essential caring for and educating children is for our world. So Rima, we are really happy to have you here today and eager to hear you. Merci. Merci and Claire, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. So I can say good morning and good afternoon. And thank you, Anne Claire, for inviting me to participate in a very important side event. And maybe it is the time to pay tribute to you and to make Mothers Matter, for as you are the oldest international organization devoted to the cause of mother, raising their voices wherever they are for their participation and social justice. And with the COVID-19 outbreak, we saw you rose to the occasion to mitigate its impact on families, mothers, and young children in different parts of the world, working with grassroots level organization. I will be speaking today about the business case for early childhood education and care and support for families being an investment in the next generation economic prosperity, social equity, and peace. We know that the COVID-19 outbreak is exacerbating existing crises around the world and where inequalities, racial injustices are becoming very evident, further violating human rights, women's rights, and children's rights. And also we know that poverty and insecurity and violence are rising, and this particularly in fragile contexts. Mr. Lockwock, who is the executive director of OCHA, which is the humanitarian organization for the United Nations, in launching the global humanitarian response to COVID-19 said, the pandemic is hurting us all, but the most devastating and destabilizing effect will be felt in the poorest countries of the world. The Sustainable Development Goals report launched just 10 days ago reveals that 71 million people are pushed back into extreme poverty. And also on several occasions, the UN Secretary General said that women and children are bearing the brunt of the pandemic effort. So with the disruption of health services, vaccination, so, and limited access to nutrition services have the potential to cause thousands of additional under five deaths and tens of thousands of additional maternal deaths in 2020. There is also a surge in reports of domestic violence against women and children. And we know that school closures have kept millions of children out of school. And to many of them, remote learning is out of reach. And we know from the millions of children out of school, many of them are girls, and we know that many of them who are the future mothers and women in the world will not go back to school. According to UNICEF and ILO, 
the disadvantaged communities also are at greater risk of child labor, child trafficking, and we also know that child marriage is increasing. So sadly, we realize that the humanitarian crisis of COVID-19 is reversing decades of progress and the impressive gains achieved for the children of the world and also derailing the realization of the sustainable development goals such as goal three, as goal one, goal four, which is education, and also goal 16 and 17. And also most important that this, uh, which uh, we know that those goals are universal, integrated and indivisible. If we do not achieve one goal, we cannot achieve the other. So what is more al alarming is that also that we know that 43% of all children under five years of age in the world are at risk of not achieving their development potential. And now, because of the pandemic, a much higher percentage of children are at risk for having devastating physical, socio-emotional, and cognitive consequences that can occur across the lifespan of the child and can continue for generations. And this affecting our societies and communities. So we all know also the value and the important role of mothers, of parents in protecting their young children, particularly during adversity and in providing them with a nurturing care they need and which is very important. Unfortunately, this is challenged by the impact of this pandemic induced humanitarian crisis on families such as death, separation, loss of jobs, food security, compounded by the psychosocial stress experienced by parents, especially mothers, that undermines their ability to fulfill their important role. But we can say with confidence that advances in development, neuroscience, and an emerging and well-established body of scientific evidence from multiple disciplines, such as epigenetics, psychology, and economics, hold significant implications for the futures of millions of children and their families, particularly those who live in fragile contexts. The good news, there are always good news, that the emerging science heralds a new era with windows of opportunities through investment in positive early development of young children as a path to sustainable development and peace by breaking the cycles of poverty and inequalities. Hence, early childhood development strategies and services are now more important than ever to mitigate the immediate and long-term impact of COVID-19 crisis. In one of our publications, ECPC publication, the, we say that multi-level ECD services can help elevate the economic productivity and sustainability of communities by increasing human capital of children and caregivers, their families, and providing economic opportunities among communities. We know that the cost benefit analysis have consistently shown that investing in early childhood development is the most powerful investment a country can make with societal returns of more than 13%. According to UNICEF also, ECD programs have shown to markedly reduce government expenditures in health, uh, in healthcare, in public aid, in child protection, which is very important, and also even in the criminal justice system. So in building back better, we have all the opportunity to shape innovative and transformative approaches and to place the interest of the people and families and communities in the heart of our recovery efforts. In the case of early childhood development, we need to continue demonstrating by science and 
practice the transformative power of early childhood development strategies and services to reduce poverty, inequity, and violence. We can build then a strong foundation for peace and security, resilience, social justice, and social cohesion, which we need now more than ever. We need to continue to entreat governments, policymakers, and community leaders to safeguard the rights of young children and their parents and prioritize investment in their survival, development, and protection. We need to protect and prioritize investment in early the programs and services in the global pandemic response and recovery efforts. We need also to ensure that gender equality, inclusion, and empowerment of mothers and parents and families and communities who should be our partners be at the center of COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. And I don't want to miss about women, empowerment of women and girls are very important and particularly education of girls. I know in my time in UNICEF, I worked for many years to put girls on the agenda of the United Nations. So it's very important. So now we need to continue designing and implementing multi-level programs rooted in the nurturing care and the benefiting the child the mother, the family, the community, and all the institution at the national and regional level. Those programs should be safe and protective, multi-sectoral and inclusive. Most importantly, they should be culturally sensitive and build on what they know and give them the space to be the driving force for change. Yes, children, women, and families, can be a driving force for change. So let's give them the occasion to do it. Most importantly, to achieve all this, we have to uphold the values of global solidarity, global cooperation, and dialogue among nations and social justice. This will put us on the right path to achieve the sustainable development goals, leaving no one behind. Let's do it. We all have our part to do. It is our shared responsibility. And thank you very much. Thank you, Rima, for such an inspiring uh, speech. And you know, when you talk about early childhood development, I always think that what the Nurturing Care Framework is saying, when you change the beginning of the story, you can change the whole story. And it's yes. all there, it's all there. Thank you so much, Rima. And I would like now to introduce our next speaker, Valentina Urestieta from Empreinte Humaine, is representing the private sector, an important stakeholder in building back better. We spend so much time working that well-being at work is key to well-being in general. Considering employees as persons, who are also parents, spouses, citizens, friends, persons who need balance in their life between paid work and private life. Considering employees as persons seems obvious, but it's certainly not the case in most work environment. And Empreinte Humaine is working on that. Today, Valentina, who is a clinical and work psychologist, will talk to us about family-friendly companies supporting mothers and fathers at the company level, and also how it works for the company. Valentina, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Anne-Claire, and all your team to put this uh, uh, very interesting uh, conference uh, together. Thank you for in your invitation and allowing me also to share our experience of uh, how our working mothers do uh, uh, and to give an example on how organizations can support quality of life at work and promote uh, a professional and, and personal uh, balance. Can we share the presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, please. Every time we intervene within companies, uh, several people from managers to teams, they say to us, 
well-being and performance. What is this association? Uh, uh, there's no association. If I'm stressed, I stop working and that's it. But well-being and performance has a very close uh, relation. Um, and yet, uh, um, because the, work, the workplace is a living environment and therefore a space allowing prevention and acting as an amplifier to promoting messages of health and education as well. So Human Imprint or Empreinte Humaine as a consultancy firm of psychologists and managers experts, uh, we work to promote psychosocial, psychosocial uh, health and safety in the workplace by supporting employees, companies with very concrete actions to bring life quality at work, have a positive impact as well at home. So our role is to prevent uh, people's health within the organization of work in general. We intervene by giving advice to management, do diagnosis or assessment on well-being at work and life quality at work, simply to allow people, especially working mothers, to say by the end of the day, I had a good job today, I don't need to work at home, I'm going to take care of my family. Uh, and we also uh, counsel companies on the way to take uh, into account the human impact of transformations and changes. And we do also uh, individual psychological support with a special, uh, um, let's say, background and, and, and expertise uh, for uh, working mothers and women in general. Thank you. You can pass the slides. Thank you. Uh, we have been very active uh, during the COVID. 19 crisis because employees and organizations found themselves in an unusual and all of the sudden situation working from home in a lockdown context with the children at home or without activity, uh, the people, employees uh, without any activity, uh, in a lockdown or exposed as well, which generated many questions, discomfort, and the search for new uh, balances. So this was quite uh, destabilizing. All the frontiers among work, home, family, and children disappear uh, within these months. And most people didn't have any roadmap, uh, roadmap to manage uh, all these areas uh, of life in the same, in the same place. Uh, we, uh, to give you an example, we published a study on the level of psychological distress of French employees during a lockdown and after. And each outcome, active women, appear to be particularly impacted, uh, um, particularly for women, they can have a more important mental workload due to our, our because I'm, a, I'm also a woman, uh, our capability of multitasking and also they need to tackle several situations at the same time. Also, we have a tendency, women, us, <laughs> Of, uh, we can have a tendency, and the, sh the study shows that, of feeling guilt for not succeeding in everything that we do. Women also uh, uh, are also the main actor coping uh, or facing the respons family responsibility and to more of the domestic work uh, uh, and childcare uh, uh, on the household almost twice as much as their male partners. In fact, gender equality, uh, uh, I think we are convinced here in you, at Human Imprint that gender, uh, gender equality uh, should start from home. So without any reference points on how to handle the COVID crisis, the work, the family, and the need to stay afloat financially at the same time, uh, the companies turned to us to put in place actions uh, in order uh, to support teams and managers, psychologically speaking, and in the daily work home organization. Can you please do next? So we, um, my, I myself, we, I, I animated around 80 workshops in two months uh, for managers and, and teams on how to balance uh, work and, and private uh, life. This was uh, a measure that several companies uh, took to support the, their teams to give concrete strategies and also to simply uh, express, have an opportunity to express themselves in, in the difficulties that they're encountering uh, during lockdown, during COVID crisis, which is actually today as well. So we did webinars, we have the UCARE uh, COVID-19 as well, uh, which is a psychological support uh, for everybody having um, um, 
difficulty psychologically speaking uh, to deal with this crisis in, in, in terms of uncertainty, anxiety, uh, scared of the future, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can pass, you can enter next. So uh, here my, I'm going to go straight to the point. Um, uh, our mission here, let's say, is to give you a very concrete example on return of investment of the measures that company have taken to, to support, uh, especially working women and working mothers. This is an example of an acting woman, uh, a single mother of three. She has 45 years old and she's, she works in a bank. And she listened to a webinar uh, that addressed the issue of personal organization about telework and uh, the work-life balance in this unique situation in the COVID-19 crisis. And she says, I, feel overwhelmed, uh, torn. I felt overwhelmed, torn among the need to take care of my children, their education, logistics, and my professional missions, which were numerous and represented a heavy workload. If there is one thing that I remember and that allowed me to get through this period serenely and make ends meet was the participation in a webinar that my employer offered me. Among the suggestions offered, one of them was to alternate between working from home and taking care of the children every hour each, work and, uh, and, and the family, during the day. It sounds an anecdotal, but it's not at all because I stopped feeling guilty. I indirectly had a message of understanding from my employer, which left me room to maneuver in my personal organization. I felt understood and greatly relieved this space suited me perfectly and I'm starting to recover without worry today by gradually resuming the pace uh, from before. So this is an example of a working uh, mother and the next slide, uh, uh, I would like to share uh, the two examples, for example, the HR population, which, which is mainly mostly women, uh, uh, were very, very impacted uh, of the health crisis. Uh, they were in the front of the field, constantly supporting employees, supporting the organization to put in place the safety measures that were constantly evolving. Uh, uh, um, and all this do, done from home with the family and kids as well as the fear of contamination, psychologically speaking. Uh, it was a very, very heavy uh, load on this woman's uh, shoulders. So, um, we offer a conference and workshops, especially for uh, this population, a safe expression space for them to feel understood, supported, and to co-build together, to feel less alone in this situation, and to build concrete practices to promote healthy organization at home and a balance with the work constraints. So this person said to me after, after the conference that she cried during the entire workshop, uh, she says, I felt less alone and somehow protected because my company was concerned about us. I felt that I was recognized as a human. And managers, they also need a lot of tools and concrete practices to support the people to bring the work, uh, uh, let's say, more human. So uh, a manager said to you, oh, this recommendation of practices will help me to support my team during crisis. Uh, they need more flexibility and autonomy, especially working mothers with uh, uh, children in, in, uh, uh, in uh, little children, let's say. Can we pass, please? Thank you. Before this crisis, um, companies were already put in place policies on simple actions to promote psychosocial health, balance and flexibility, having a direct and positive impact uh, on life at home. So I'm, I'm giving you many, many examples that we worked with uh, several companies uh, uh, with the human imprint, uh, one plant human team. For example, it's the message that we need to uh, keep here is that Caring at work is very, very simple. It doesn't cost that much. It's, for example, this, this uh, action of no meetings early in the morning after 5 p.m. PM or during lunch hours, this simple action uh, culturally shared within the organization and promoted by, by the uh, comics, let's say, this increases flexibility and reduces, of course, uh, stress uh, or burnout. And they have, for example, another company, 
having policies on flexible hours and the work was organized more by objectives rather than time schedules. So this increases trust and the possibility, especially for working mothers to organize their, their, their lives uh, in, in a matter of speaking. Um, for example, in, the, in this company uh, had an external service we offer to parents, uh, they offer to parents safe spaces with specialized caretakers to watch over their children while uh, parents are at work. Uh, creation of, of protocols against harassment. Uh, this is a very important issue that we need to tackle and we need to consider today at work. And we need to train, uh, also uh, we do a, a lot these days, very much these days, is training sessions to promote, not to say stop harassment, but also to promote healthy behaviors and active investigations in case uh, of complaint. And for example, uh, policies in, uh, imposing an inclusive framework in terms of salary and professional growth and company uh, in the transport sector, for example, that I very uh, I liked it very much this, uh, this, um, this project with them because they put in place meetings called safe spaces encounters for women to feel uh, that can, they can express themselves on what they can live in terms of sexism uh, at work. And another very concrete example, a company in the marketing sector identified that especially their working women were suffering from high stress levels and in some cases burnout. And they reacted by doing an assessment on well-being at work to see what is going on and to put words objective, objectively in, on the situation. And they put afterwards uh, in place protective measure, measures to establish a healthy framework between well-being and performance, flexibility in terms of schedule, et cetera, et cetera. And we also did a diagnosis uh, to assess uh, uh, the specificity of women within companies living in a societal and working conditions. Uh, women continue to take care of the education of their children. So uh, there, there is an important issue that we um, deal within company, companies is to, to create awareness on the part of especially the management of increase, uh, this is this exposure that is increasing on, on psychological distress. So to conclude, I would like to say that uh, the workplace represents an important amount of time for working mothers uh, and has a direct impact on private life, health and education. The workplace can promote a balance between these uh, uh, these areas of our lives, especially the desire of, of professional growth and motherhood, companies can, can promote this and women can feel that they can grow professional, professionally and also in their private life to give this opportunity. And organizations have everything in hand to build a simple and concrete actions to promote health, education, quality life of work and for us, when uh, uh, in return of investment, when we see companies that put in place such measures is because they talk to their people, they talk to their employees. So dialogue is key to implement simple and concrete actions to promote health, education and well-being at work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina, for this uh, perspective from the employees and we wish that many companies will follow your good practices. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Rutger Ukstra. And Rutger, Rutger, it's very important to have you with us today because your mission, from what I heard, is to replace what you call the beyond GDP cottage industry by a strong, multinational, well-organized, beyond GDP multinational, capable to compete the GDP multinational. And the uh, beyond GDP, we should speak one language with a unified voice about a common project. Well, among our speakers, we have many partisans of the new system. We have feminist economists. We have representatives of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Uh, we have representatives of the private sectors, sector. And we at MMM, we want to make sure that the new system includes care and education, not only as indicators, but as, as cornerstones. 
and you heard the voices of the MMM members. So, Rutger, we would be really interested to see what you have to, to hear what you have to say to all those voices. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much for that uh, introduction and the summary of, of my book. <laughs> um, yes, I, um, perhaps can I, I have my slides uh, up? Yeah, th thanks very much for the invitation and I'm really looking forward or, or I've already enjoyed very much the, the discussion and um, I think as you also said uh, and Claire, um, my role is I think a little bit to kind of take the two communities and try and bring them together and see where the Beyond GDP community could strengthen the care and education and how the care and education uh, might influence the G uh, Beyond GDP uh, debate. Um, my own background is that I worked in statistics for 20 years at the Dutch Statistical Office. And there it becomes so apparent that we have this one dominant indicator, uh, GDP for uh, economics, and that there are so many areas of life that are important, um, environmental uh, concerns, as Professor Folber said, but also very much distributional and, and gender issues. So basically the way I wanted to structure it is just to give you uh, some insight in the beyond GDP discussion and how perhaps the uh, care and education and uh, the MMM uh, um, uh, lobby might actually help in, in uh, finding ways in, in this discussion. Um, so next slide, please. So just to give a, a quick summary, uh, in my book, I actually summarized hundreds of beyond GDP indicators, um, but I think that's part of the problem. Um, you know, this is so such a large cottage industry that it's sometimes difficult to see what the real, um, you know, what the real uh, uh, important ones are. Now, this is one uh, that is um, quite influential uh, come, uh, amongst economists called the genuine progress indicator. And as you can see on the left, uh, there was a time series made of the development of gross domestic product and also the development of the genuine progress indicator. And what it actually shows that while gross domestic product keeps increasing uh, actually in the entire post-war period, Actually, since the 1970s, we have no longer been making progress if you actually measure all the costs and benefits of, of our societal changes. Uh, now, on the right, you'll see which components are measured and given a monetary value. And as you can see, the value of household labor and the value of volunteer work is actually a principal component of actually an addition to uh, macroeconomic uh, measurements. But there are also, of course, a lot of um, you know, negative subtractions to the GDP, which results in this stagnation. Uh, cost of crime, family breakdown, underemployment, all, I think, which are also very much related to care, to education. So it's not just, I think, these two components, which are uh, very important. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, uh, I see that the animation has, has disappeared, so I'm going to have to talk you through uh, some of the, um, uh, this, uh, these slides. I instead of showing you the hundreds of Beyond GDP uh, uh, systems, I think I want to just focus on um, a, a couple that, which I think are important and which you might you know, identify as uh, you know, ones that you would want to influence. So. Uh, the, the one I just described is an index, so it provides one number of societal progress and it's conceptual in the sense that it provides an e economist perspective on the whole topic. Uh, and on the bottom right hand corner you see uh, something which I think we've all heard of, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is, which is a dashboard of indicators. Um, um, and it's non-conceptual, so it's very politically driven. Uh, so it's a different aspect. But even there, there is uh, SDG 5, which is about gender equality. And there's specifically one indicator, uh, 5.4.1, which specifically looks at care work and domestic, uh, domestic chores. So sometimes it's also very useful uh, to, to uh, target like one indicator, for example, in the SDG process. 
now there are also there's also the work of Jeffrey Sachs, who has created an SDG index, which basically summarizes all these indexes um, into one number. And a really important report is the Stiglitz report from 2009, which also really stresses uh, disparities and gender issues. And I think the OCD has done a particularly good job in the Better Life Initiative in actually um, you know, measuring uh, uh, these things, because I think one of the big problems is that quite often, you know, a lot of these measurements are, are not done frequently enough. And, and that's why we don't really, we're not able uh, to really point to them frequently enough. Um, one thing which I'm really interested in is, uh, is the psychological methodologies. Um, so uh, one is called the UN index, which is from a, um, uh, Nobel Prize winner Kahneman, uh, which is on the next slide, uh, please. And they actually developed a method called the National Time Use Accounting. Uh, and um, what it shows you that in the last column, it shows the number of hours that you spend on certain activities. And the first column is the activities that you uh, spend your time on. Uh, and then there's an, uh, a rating according to positive negative feelings, but also other feelings like feeling competent. So I think this is also interesting from what Valentina just discussed, that it adds kind of the psychological aspects of this. Now, interestingly, they, when they developed this method, they actually did a panel of, of um, 909 women, uh, working uh, women, and they measured the working day uh, of that population. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a representative for the entire population, but definitely uh, it's supposed to be representative of the working day of, of women. Uh, and as you can see, the, the worst things to do are uh, commuting, uh, working um, uh, in terms of positive effect, <laughs> housework, uh, sometimes uh, surprising to people taking care of my children. Uh, actually, if you measure it at a time basis, uh, people uh, will uh, respond in this way. If you, if you say in a generic way, you know, what do you enjoy then spending time with my children will be very high. But when you ask it in a time use survey, usually it scores quite low. And at the top, uh, intimate relations, sex, socializing, relaxing, prayer, worship, meditation. Um, and I think it's, I think what's important about this is that it shows you, um, you know, that there are there's also gray scales, I think, in terms of your enjoyment of these things and that well-being sometimes can also be quite complex because if you look at work, for example, it scores really poorly on, um, on the positive effect um, and the, the analysis that they do, it actually shows that time pressure is one of the worst things about work and I th think that also responds to what Valentina just said, you know, when you're feeling very much time pressure, then you have, um, you know, that lo leads to a lot of stress. But if you look at the co column about competence, so do you feel as if you're doing something that you're competent at, that you're good at, that you're confident uh, about, that you're doing something um, that you're good at, then actually work scores really highly. So, and that's what I like about their research is that it adds, I think, psychological aspects, which some of the, um, you know, more regular uh, approaches perhaps do not. Um, and final slide is also that this also, I think, leads up to some analysis of, you know, the, what COVID uh, might have in terms of effects on, on uh, women and, and men and, and children. Um, this is, I think, what uh, Professor Fulber was referring to uh, the New York Times uh, article. And I think these are the results that uh, that um, headline was based on. It shows that in February, March and April, it shows the time use um, for working parents. Uh, and it shows that actually women, uh, especially of the youngest children, uh, have been taking a, a lot more time off, basically, uh, or a lot, not a lot more time off, but a lot more time in terms of uh, supporting uh, children. Uh, um, so the disparity is actually increasing and from a statistical perspective. 
Now, one last thing that I really want to stress is that I think the urgency of this problem is very clear, but the measurement um, simply is lagging behind. And one of the biggest problems that we have, and I, I think which would solve which would help the beyond GDP community if, if there was just simply more time use measurement. Um, and the real problem behind that is that it's just so expensive to do a time use survey. So there is simply not that much being done around that. Uh, and I would, uh, one of the things that I try and develop in my book, given that I find time use so important, is that I would like to see more big data, or, you know, big data kind of applications of time use. Uh, you know, Google for this pandemic is actually providing data, uh, public data, on whether we are at home, whether we are in the workplace, and all these kind of things. Um, and... Uh, uh, I think, you know, there's a strange situation that from a government policy perspective, we have very little data on these, uh, on time use, and actually companies know probably what we're doing on an hourly minute basis, and there must be some kind of uh, middle ground where we, you know, we have privacy issues covered, but we're not relying on these really expensive surveys. So I, I do think that if we want to move this forward, then the time use measurement really needs to go toward less from survey design towards big data design so that we can also see you know real in real time perhaps even sometimes the changes that are happening so thank you very much for the invitation and uh, um, very happy to be involved also in the question and answers later on thank you Roger. what was really interesting in your last slide was the gender gap is not only for small children. It's no, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> and that's interesting because there is a tendency to say, okay, small children take time. And then when they get adolescent, but it shows that it's not right. It's not like that. Thank yeah. you very much for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Susan Himmelweit. Sue, thank you very much for being here. You have been working for years on the economics of caring. You have been denouncing how the root of inequality is unpaid care work, which is what mothers do. And I even heard you say that reproduction of people is exactly what women spend their time doing. We, you said, are involved in caring activities. We are involved in all those things that keep life going on. Now, this unpaid care work that women spend so much time doing, we know it is essential and we know it is work, but it is not recognized as such. So uh, Sue, please give us your view on how to include care when building back better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk in on the, the last thing you said about building back better. But I'd also like to talk a little bit about the organization that I come from that some of you know. Can I have my slides, please? Um, we have um, at the Women's Budget Group, um, actually you could go on to the next one, please. Next slide. Um, we have spent many years, as some of you know, doing critiques of government policy, either, pro either proposals or um, actual policy from a gender point of view. We do the gender analysis that we think the government ought to be doing but we do it instead of economic and social policy um, and we've on the whole been used that in a critical sense we've been critical both of particular policies for not taking account of their gender impact but also the government itself for not taking account of um, not doing that gender analysis itself um, but this year we had an opportunity, we got um, some funding to have what we call a commission on a gender and equal economy. And that was our chance to sort of think about proactively developing policies that would build a gender equal economy. And we've, we've set it up in the form of having experts from a number of organizations, think tanks, trade unions, academics, uh, business some journalists, and the chair is somebody who's probably quite well known to people here, Diane Elson. And we've commissioned papers on a lot of different areas um, and, asked, and asked 
ask for evidence from some people who don't normally give evidence to these things, including experts by experience, and to look at the interconnection between different gender inequalities. So rather than, as we've often done in the past, talked about one, one particular gender inequality at a time, we're focusing on all those in, interconnections and the way they have feedback mechanisms that reinforce their inequalities. And in doing that, by looking at those links, we're saying, if we act on those links, if we can think of policies that break those links, that will be the way to get gender, gender equality or get less gender inequality. But we have to do it on all those links simultaneously. And one of the things that we found, of course, not very surprisingly, is that the unequal division of unpaid care is at their heart. So can I have the next slide, please? So if you like, this is the sort of picture that we've been drawing and it will be up in the, a link to it will be in the chat um, or on the website for this because we can't go through it in detail now. But you'll get the general impression that by looking at the division of um, the unequal division of unpaid care, we can trace out how a huge number of different inequalities um, figure. Um, and sorry. Um, but one of the things that's missing in that diagram is actually the feedback mechanisms. So we're not just looking at it as a spiral with a single cause, but one in which all those things also feed back into reinforcing that unequal division of unpaid care. So um, we have to see it as not just a spiral, but a, a web, a web of all those interconnections that reinforce each other. And what the issue is, the thing that's down the bottom, how do we break that? How do we break that cycle? Can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of the pandemic, we think the answer is quite fairly obvious what falls out of this. In, in order to build back better, we need a more equal gender economy. And what do we need for that? We need a recovery based on care. So we need to invest in care and that will generate jobs and reduce gender inequality. Um, we see that, um, we have a lot of talk in my country, like in most other countries, about a Green New Deal, and we see it as not a competitor, but a complement to it. And in fact, we have managed to persuade, you know, people pushing specifically for a Green New Deal, that um, greater investment in health and social care should be part of it. And they have all written it into their programmes. They often tend to forget about it when it actually comes to presenting their program because they tend to focus on physical infrastructure. And part of our argument is it's not, we also need to think about our social infrastructure. And in particular, we talk about care as part of it, but actually a very similar argument could be made for education. Um, I'm very sorry, but my um, timer isn't working. So I don't know where I'm on, on time. So <laughs> could you tell me? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Fine, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So we have done some analysis of what would, how many jobs would be generated by investing a certain amount of money in care rather than in construction. So a lot of the Build Back Better projects, even the green ones, are effectively construction projects. There to say, you know, let's go insulating lots of houses. That's the construction, it's the construction industry that you would invest in for doing that. And we've said, what about instead investing in the care industry, uh, by which we mean both social care for elderly people, for all people, uh, disabled people, or for children, it includes childcare. Um, and you can look at the jobs cr created directly, the jobs created indirectly in other industries that supply supply the ones you invest in but also what about the workers the workers who's who have now got wages that they didn't have before and then they spend it and we have looked at this for a number of countries who've actually done the US too but for some reason it's not on this um, unfortunately we've only looked at um, fairly developed economies because of the data requirements for doing this but using input output analysis you can see that in every country the number of jobs created 
by investing in care is much greater than the number of jobs invested in created by investing in construction and the gender balance is quite different um, it's not as extreme in fact for investing in care as it is for investing in construction investing in construction you get far more jobs for men investing in care you get far more jobs for women um, but the disparity is particularly extreme for construction which is a problem since that's what most people think about when they're talking about building back even building back better um, but because there are so many jobs created um, so many more jobs created by investing in care you actually even get close to the same number of jobs for men by doing that as for women can i have the next slide please less than five minutes Susan. okay that's fine but one of the issues is isn't that just producing poor quality jobs for women if we spend money on care are we not getting all these extra jobs simply because those women are so badly paid um, so what we're arguing is that we actually want a better care system and for most of the countries in the of the that i looked at before that means a larger proportion of the population involved in provide, providing care recognizing that successful care depends very much on the skill of those people doing the carers the, the people doing the care and so transforming the job of care through a training better pay a career structure for paid carers um, and anyway if we're actually to expand the care workforce even to fill the vacancies that exist in many countries you need you're going to have to improve the conditions because it, or there are recruitment and retention problems so let's take the best of the countries that we have on our list which is sweden not surprisingly there we have 10 percent of the workforce employed in care care workers are still actually not very well paid but they're not as badly paid as and 4.8% of Sweden's GDP is spent on care. But you do have to remember that even in Sweden, most care is carried out unpaid within families. So even if care, Sweden has the largest professionalized care workforce, it's still the majority of care is done unpaid. And we would argue that investment in care is necessary to improve the lives of all women, including the unpaid carer. So it's spending some money on providing paid care, good quality paid care, but that will also improve the lives of unpaid carers. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is what, let's suppose all these countries decided to spend um that sort of money that the sort of money that sweden does on care and paid wages similar as a percentage of out there, their average wage to that paid in sweden and you can see again that huge numbers of jobs would be created um you might be like to guess why so many more in the us than anywhere else um and th the answer is because there is so little spent on care and such bad wages paid in my country the uk there is more spent on care but the wages are still bad so you still get a lot of jobs um, but you can see that these are figures that make a substantial up a substantial proportion of the estimates of the unemployment that's going to be generated in these countries so we're arguing basically of a shift for people from the jobs the sort of jobs that they used to have to expanding good quality care can i have the last slide please so what we're arguing is that what we call a care-led recovery would improve the care services who may for those who need them generate significant employ, employment much more than investment in same same spending with investment in construction reduce the gender employment gap but still create a lot of jobs for men and above all it's an investment in the future it's an investment in better cared for people and in preventing greater needs in the future finally in terms of the green new deal aspect of it it's completely sustainable in fact in the future if we're going to have a sustainable economy rather than spending our time producing more things that's what we're all going to have to be doing is caring for each other more and learning how to do so better thank you very much wow what a beautiful ending thank you Sue. <laughs> thank you very much sue for this uh uh, presentation and the spirals of inequality slide is actually a video and you were uh, you received the link to the video on your chat 
and it's really worth looking at. It says it all. And it shows also how necessary it is to act now. Well, our last speaker today is Amanda Janou from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Thank you very much for being here and representing the Alliance, which is a very important stakeholder. Um, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance believes that humanity should determine economics, not the other way around. And in the same way at MMM, we believe that mothers should have to take part in determ determining the, de the decisions that affect their lives and that of their children. So you work for the well-being economy to uh, help government craft their economic policies with the purpose of a more just and sustainable world. Three governments are part of this alliance, New Zealand, Scotland and Iceland, all three headed by women. Amanda, we are eager to hear how the well-being economy uh, being Im implemented in these three countries, how can it recognize and support care, unpaid care and education? Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, first of all, let me just say how honored I am to be on this panel with such incredible thinkers and speakers. So we've already heard a lot of insights um, regarding the challenges of our current economic thinking and the way that we measure progress and how it all relates to the value of caregiving in our economy. But I'd like to use this opportunity just to speak a bit about this topic from my experience working on economic policy, specifically in the international development space and also now with the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, because I feel that so much of the progress ahead really lies in aligning economic policies with culture, value, and well-being goals. So um, I remember one of the most powerful moments in my career was during a project in Mozambique when an economist explained to me that this country's culture needed to change if they wanted to develop. Um, he said that investors were having a really hard time in Mozambique because people would be hired for long-term contracts but would show up for a day or two and then just leave and go back to their villages and only return again once they needed more money for their families and communities. And when I spoke to one of my Mozambican friends about this, he said, look, you may have watches, but we've got time. Mm -hmm. And it was a culture that, that understood how much was enough and the value of time over material possessions. This was a culture that recognized the true value of money and that it was a means to ensure the needs of a family and community. Um, and I realized in that moment that I didn't have this concept of enough. We don't even consider this question in the US. There can never be enough. Um, and we really don't have an understanding of the value of time where we actively brag about being overworked and busy. And so these questions of what do we really want and when will we be satisfied were really profound for me and made me realize that we'd gotten this whole development thing a bit wrong and we had a lot more to learn from these communities um, than we felt we had to teach. So I was saw that one of the major problems in the field was that external economists and consultants were writing economic policies for these countries and always with the assumption that GDP growth was the only legitimate goal. So I worked on developing tools and approaches that could support governments to develop economic strategies and policies based on other goals that were specific to um, their particular context and culture and values. And from this experience, it became really clear to me that who engages in policy making matters a lot. So in Myanmar, I worked with a ministry of industry that was mostly women. And this was my first time working with an economic ministry that had the majority women. And it was also the first time that export competitiveness was not even discussed. So rather they identified rural urban inequality reduction as the major objective of the industrial policy. And this led to a very different consideration of the kind of economic activities and behaviors that they wanted to promote through their policy to achieve their goals. And so we spent a lot of time 
for example, talking about the textile sector. And they were quite interested in thinking about ways to support rural women to work from home so that they could still care for their families and communities whilst making money. So having women involved in economic policy makes a big difference because they tend to be more aware of the fact that the economy is, is really just the way we provide for one another and care work is a huge part of that. However, the economic transformation that we're, we're looking for really requires not only different kinds of policymakers, but a different kind of policymaking altogether. So in order to really move beyond GDP and our narrow understanding of value in the economy, as Nancy said, we need truly participatory policy processes. We need to invite all people to engage in discussions around what truly matters for collective well-being now and for generations to come. So this is what we've been working on at the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Um, so as an alliance, we bring together academics, organizations, activists, and policymakers who are committed to fundamental systems change. Um, and we're working to move beyond critiques of the current economic system and to construct new narratives and visions about how the economy can work in service to people and planet. Um, and so this really requires us changing our understanding of the economy from something given and fixed to something we have the power to actively transform um, so that it's aligned with our values and the things that matter most for our human and ecological well-being. One of the really exciting initiatives in this well-being economy space is WeGo, or the Well-Being Economy Governments Partnership. And so this is what you mentioned, Anne Claire, um, and it's currently comprised, as you said, of New Zealand, Scotland, and Iceland, but also now we Wales, and we have some, some more states that are keen to join soon. And this group of countries is committed to moving beyond GDP as a measure of progress and work to share knowledge and policy practices as they strive to build well-being economies in, in each of their states. So each of them have developed alternative frameworks and metrics for monitoring national progress in areas such as well-being, dignity, compassion, and each of them have social, economic, and environmental indicators at their core. And when I think that the process of developing these frameworks is very interesting as Scotland, for example, established street stalls all around the country and developed various community consultation meetings to identify the 11 national outcomes that were most important for their society. With an example being that one of their priority outcomes is that all Scottish people grow up loved, safe, and respected so that they can realize their full potential. And New Zealand, working on developing the first well being budget in the world, had their statistics agency go out into communities, including meeting with rural knitting clubs, to find measurements that could really work to assess priorities such as child well being in the country. So each of these countries now have, of the WeGo countries, have alternative frameworks to monitor progress in areas that are important for human and ecological well-being. But this is really only the beginning of the journey towards the well-being economy, as each of these governments is still trying to figure out how to meaningfully align their vision with their economic system. But we are seeing some really exciting and inspiring policy initiatives coming from these countries on the basis of this different orientation. Um, and one of them, for example, is Iceland. So Iceland's made incredible progress in the areas of gender equality and caregiving and have instituted, for example, a law that covers nine months of parental leave for birth, adoption, or foster care for all citizens in Iceland, including self-employed people. And on top of this, parents are required to split the time equally to ensure that children grow up with equal care for both parents and that workloads are ultimately balanced moving forward. Another good example is New Zealand, who having really crushed this COVID crisis, emerged now prioritizing policies like reduced work weeks as a way of stimulating the economy and creating more time for people to connect care and engage in the activities they enjoy. 
I do believe that these kind of policies we're seeing are really just the beginning. So we're in a moment of profound transformation, as I think all the panelists have, have said in terms of social, political, economic, and environmental change. But what seemed once to be totally impossible is now seemingly necessary. So as we engaged in this great pause, we saw how incredibly important caregiving is for our society. We saw families, communities, and caregivers step up to ensure that people are receiving the food, care, and services they need. And we're still in the middle of this crisis. And so it's hard to know exactly how this is all gonna play out. But I believe that perspectives are shifting and that we've been given an opportunity to reevaluate what really matters in our lives. So when you ask people what matters most for well-being, one of the most common answers you'll hear is love. And love is something that we can't quantify, measure, or monetize, but its importance in our lives is really unwavering. So deep down, we know what matters. And I believe that if we support and engage with people, that we can transform our economy so that everyone is sufficiently provided for in a way that promotes human flourishing and is in harmony with our natural environment. So in a well-being economy, we will not need to monetize care or reproductive work for it to be deemed valuable because our understanding of value will be determined by its contribution to our well-being goals. So my hope and it, is that someday we will end up in a situation where Americans will be asking Mozambicans for advice on how to structure our economy so that we can better value time and to foster contentment, community, and care. So the well-being economy is as much about the journey as it is the destination. It's about transforming the way that we discuss and engage with the economy and recognizing that the only thing that's limiting economic change is our own imagination. So I would really like to invite everyone to get involved um, in the well-being economy movement because I think that with our powers combined, we can really transform the values that underpin this economic system so that we can ensure justice and sustainability for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda, for a very inspiring speech. and. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists if you would agree that uh, considering what happens in Mozambique, we could extend the time five minutes. And uh, just so we have 10 minutes of question and answers and five minutes for Duncan and, and thank, would that be all right for you or would you rather stop at 9.30? We already ex extended the time. See, we are right there now. Is it okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we are going to uh, yeah. uh, the question and answer. We received many questions before the, the today when people registered. And there is one question that I would like to answer myself before because people were coming back with that. What about the fathers? Many, questions, many people were asking that. Of course, MMM believes firmly that fathers are just as important as mothers for the children's development. But our mission is dedicated to mothers. Uh, our advocacy, though, includes the need of support and recognition for fathers as well. And we have been working with uh, the Men Care Alliance. That's a global fatherhood campaign. And one of their goals is that around the world, men do 50% of the caregiving work. So we both know that we need each other, but our mission is about mothers. Okay, we will start with, um, how will I do this? Uh, there was one question, uh, question that we're coming back and I, I think maybe Sue and, and, and Nancy would, would answer that. When building back better, what can be done to, uh, on, the, on the one hand, uh, give due credit to the, uh, and support uh, the mother's nurturing care uh, that they give to their children and that is essential for their children's development on one hand. And on the other hand, address the necessity to secure financial security for women, to have more women at decision-making levels. In one word, to protect women from discrimination, they, when the discrimination they face 
when they perform what they think is really important, taking care of their children, which is unpaid. And that uh, 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 hinders their career. So how can we reconcile these two? This question is open to everybody, but um, who would like to start? Maybe Sue? Well, um, I think that having good, one of, the, one of the possible advantages of the pandemic has been that more people have actually seen care up front. So um, we have figures in the UK, which are very like the ones that Nancy talked about. Ours actually look directly at who is doing the looking after children. And it's not surprising to my mind that this goes up to older children too, because there's been a lot of people having to do homeschooling um, in the UK. And I'm moderately optimistic. On the one hand, women have been doing far more than men have been doing of it, but men have been doing more than they've been done before. And they, it has also demonstrated to a lot of people, both um, men and women, but and their employers, that care is something that you actually have to devote time to. Um, I think there is very, there are some other very bad fall, fall, fallouts of the pandemic for women. They've lost their jobs much more quickly than than men, and this is partly to do with the types of jobs they've been doing. So it's one of the reasons why I think this is a moment to start talking about collective responsibility for care. Um, so part of it is what I was talking before in my presentation, which is actually investing directly in care services, but it's also about reshaping um, other aspects of the economy to take account of care. So that I think we could make a case now for all policy decisions having to be care proofed if you like and proof isn't quite the right word but to to to, have to consider what their implications are for how care is given and how care is received and the quality of care that results from that um, and i would like to see a general case being made for that i think people would be quite receptive to it my my difficulty with these things is usually that you can convince people very easily to say yes to it you can't convince them to remember it when they're talking about the policies that they really have in mind or the you know the things that they think are really important but to keep we have to work hard as to how to keep it on the agenda mm -hmm. anyone else yes yes Sima. yeah thank you very much i think we have now all opportunities, as I said, to build back better. Uh, we have, of course, the sustainable development goals. Of course, they are linked also to our response uh, for recovery. But most importantly is to raise the importance of motherhood and parents also, because the, the role of the father is as important. But how to do it, the value and put them at the center of our response but most importantly maybe action what to do i think for example unicef for example they have cash transfers for parents uh, all the packages for recovery are very important for families and also guidelines guidelines have uh, i know that unicef is doing it uh, for parents also it's very important at this very difficult time during this difficult time in this humanitarian crisis but also for recovery and also i remember for example family laws in september last year unicef launched family laws and how important they are so we have to work more on family laws and really request policy makers to uphold those rights, to uphold the rights of mothers, to uphold the rights of parents, which also have an impact on all communities. Thank you, Rima. Next. But also not to forget, sorry, uh, also not to forget that when we do this, we break we break the cycle of poverty and inequalities, which we are seeing that they are on the rise. And most importantly, this economic, this opportunity for rising economic productivity is also has an impact also on keeping peace and cohesion in the communities. Thank you. That's right. That's right. 
We won't have time for another question, so I suggest that all who wants to answer that question do it now, and uh, unfortunately, time exists. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone else who wants to say something about that? Okay, so um, I'm, I'm sorry, this is time. We had loads of questions and uh, we unfortunately, we should do another webinar to answer them all because there were some really interested. What about universal basic income? Uh, what are the priorities to put forward uh, at this time, what, are the what about the countries, the developing countries and the countries at war? Uh, well, okay, we won't answer that, unfortunately. And um, there was one that will lead to um, Duncan. As mothers, how best can we ensure that the voices of our children and youngsters are heard so that they have a say in creating today the future that they will inherit from us? That was a question we had. And uh, here uh, I will give the, the floor to Duncan Fisher, who has given himself the mission of representing children and advocating for their well being. So um, his blog, Child and Family Blog, are, is a gold mine. Duncan, thank you very much for being here. And please notice that we have asked a father to conclude the event that was organized by Make Mothers Matter. Thank you very much, Duncan, to do that for us. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And it, it, it truly is uh, uh, an honor, a bit daunting to be, to be asked as a father to, to end this, this, you know, to say a few comments. But uh, I, uh, I, for the last 20 years, I've been advocating for the, the role of men in caring um, and looking at it from a child development perspective. Um, I serve on the Gender Equality Commission that uh, Sue uh, presented and I'm also um, involved in setting up the Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Wales which is the country that has just joined um, the, the other three countries and it's but now now unfortunately the Wellbeing Government Partnership is three women leaders and one man um, but the Welsh leader has got a very, a very high target to reach to, to stand alongside uh, those other um, prime ministers, uh, which he probably will do uh, in, in the forthcoming COP26. Um, at the heart, at the very heart of the well-being economics is this idea of care, as, as Sue has pointed out. And I just want to make a sort of personal, a bit more personal reflection or political, if you like, um, one way I feel you can understand well-being is to consider its exact opposite, because in the UK, the opposite of well-being is in the ascendant, populism. Um, the UK, populism is about enriching the elite. Uh, it doesn't care about people at all. It brutally undermines well-being. And in the UK, as in the US and other, some other countries, we're being overrun by it. Um, a BBC uh, statistics programme estimated that between 30,000 and 45,000 people in the UK died unnecessarily because the government delayed action to protect people for just seven days while it tried to keep the shops open. Uh, and no one in the UK, and this is where I speak from Wales, which is part of the UK, which uh, no one has paid the price for that except the dead and those who mourn them. So I feel, although there's been a lot about the positivity of the future, I feel we are entering very dark times and that well-being will become a matter of life and death uh, as, it, as it has been shown to do in the last few months. Um, and what I, the, the, the real what, only single point I'd like to make is how happy I am that the well that the uh, Gender Equality Commission in the UK has adopted the well-being narrative and will, when its final report comes out, it will talk about well-being and gender equality and care as one thing. Um, and that for me is a, uh, a, a, a big step forward after 20 years of advocating for that, exactly that kind of thing. I think as care becomes more and more honoured and valued. In the UK we spent every Thursday 
evening, standing out outside of houses clapping for carers. It was an extraordinary event. But as we see that, and we see that our lives literally depend on care, I hope that, that well-being and that idea of, of it being in part of the economy uh, becomes a mainstream narrative uh, in the gender equality debate. And if we make care, as the Gender Equality Commission has, has done, if we make, if we see care as the key and as the key driver of gender equality, I think we're, we're focusing on the right thing. We're focusing on the thing of greatest value, of greatest importance, which is care. So I'm delighted that these agendas are, uh, have come together uh, and I'm honoured to, 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 you know, to speak to you all today. Thank you, Duncan. And I also have one hope that we will collaborate and keep talking together and acting to make uh, the, better, the future better. This is the end of our event. It remains available on Facebook and will be soon on YouTube. I really thank all our panelists for their invaluable contribution. Let's keep talking, let's keep in touch. And um, sorry for the delay in time, but I think it was worth it, really. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, see you soon, I hope. <laughs>